We're delighted to have uh, at our School of Tyrannus a special guest today, Dr. Mike Stallard, who is uh, the Professor of Systematic Theology at the Independent Baptist Seminary in Pennsylvania. And uh, Mike, we're delighted to have you with us today to uh, uh, share a few things with our viewers. And um, you've been teaching there at, uh, did I get the name of the uh, school uh, correctly? Well, Baptist Bible Seminary yeah. there in Clarkstown, Pennsylvania. We're near Scranton in the northeast corner of the state. Very good. How long have you been there? I'm um, starting about my 12th year. So you're well established there. Well established. You're, you're, are, you're, are you the dean or the head of the... Uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm director of the PhD program and teach systematic theology. I'm not the dean or any of that. Very good. Systematic theology. And that's your field, isn't it? You, you received your doctorate at Dallas Theological Seminary. That's correct. In that field. That's correct. Well, that's a very worthy field, and uh, we're delighted that you're teaching up there. Uh, how many students are there at uh, Baptist Bible Seminary? Uh, the seminary has between 230 to 250 in that range of students. I've been pretty consistent uh, during my time that I've been teaching there. And I guess most of the graduates go out to uh, pastor in uh, independent Baptist churches. Yeah, independent Baptist churches, Bible churches, ISCA churches. Probably some missionaries. Uh, for. Right. Uh, well, what are some of the things that uh, concern you in your field or in, in what's going on in the seminaries and the churches today? Okay, uh, let me start with what I consider to be the most important thing, and that is an area of just interpreting the Bible. Uh, I believe the Bible should be interpreted literally. That means grammatical historical interpretation. In other words, there's a context historically and grammatically for understanding the Bible. I don't read my ideas into it. I don't read later verses of the Bible back into older verses of the Bible. I take it at, at face value. Is that unusual? Don't most uh, interpreters uh, look at it that way? I think there are a lot more who claim that than actually do that. Um, I think our dispensational heritage, we try to be consistent in that. I don't think anybody's perfect at that, but I think we make an honest effort uh, to take the Bible as it was in as it was given, there's no hidden codes. We're not looking for hidden meanings, secret meanings. We're looking for what the text actually says mm -hmm. and trying to put it together. And I think there are a lot of folks out there who are coming to the Bible with a presupposition that you shouldn't take it literally at face value. And, and sometimes maybe they're embarrassed at some of the conclusions and want to go somewhere else. But I don't know. Or they may be split on the thing. They may take uh, uh, passages on... Uh, uh, salvation, literally, uh, you know, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, and they'll say, yes, that is literal, literal. but when it comes to uh, future things, prophecy, eschatology, uh, they say, no, 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 you can't th take that literally, and it, it has to be taken uh, uh, allegorically or something like that. H how do you respond to that kind of thing? Well, it, uh, in fact, I'm, I'm going to mention in, in my paper here at the Conservative Theological Society, tomorrow an example from Luke chapter 1 where Gabriel appears to Mary to tell her about the virgin birth and in that passage there's several things that a lot of scholars and Bible interpreters will take literally like the virgin birth uh, like his name is going to be Jesus like the Holy Spirit comes upon Mary but in the same text right there in the same text won't take he'll reign over on the throne of David over the house of Jacob and of his kingdom to be no end, they won't take that literally, just like the Jewish girl would have understood it in yes. that time period. And uh, to me, that's inconsistent. And, and to me, we need to get away from uh, picking and choosing. We need to be fair with what God is trying to say. Not, not be schizophrenic when it comes to yeah. interpreting. That's, that's a good way to say it. <laughs> I, I didn't mention the, the fact that uh, Dr. Stallard is uh, one of the featured speakers at our Conservative Theological Society conference this week, and that's why we have the opportunity of seeing him again, as we uh, like to do uh, at least once a year, and uh, why he is here and able to have this interview with us today. Um, well, in addition to uh, interpretation, hermeneutics, and so forth, um, what other approaches to the Bible are important and, and need to be, we need to be concerned about? Well, uh, I think in, in theology, probably always at the top of the list, after you understand how to interpret the Bible, 
the top of the list is the nature of the Bible, what it is itself. Because if you're wrong there, you're wrong in everything else. And, and at the heart of that is the Bible is the inspired, inerrant word of God. It really comes from him. He is its source, and since God's character is perfect, it's, it's really a fallacy to say that the Bible would somehow not be inerrant. And in our own day, a lot of people want to say, well, the Bible's inerrant in terms of its intent, but not in terms of its facts. And uh, I totally disagree with that. You, you can't have a halfway house there either. You need to go with it all the way or throw it away. Uh, and uh, Some people challenge the historicity of the events in the Bible. Is that in the same category? I think so. It's in the same category, but there are a lot less people that challenge that today than 150 years ago. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, the more they find uh, uncovering in the rocks uh, and in the excavations and everything, it's uh, so many historical facts are being proven. Uh, I think you're right. Daniel 5 is an example. The Nabonidus Chronicle, now we understand Belshazzar was probably a real person, mm -hmm. and, and uh, he was co-regent uh, under his father, and, uh, and so it made sense for Daniel to be given the third place in the kingdom rather than the second place in the kingdom. All of that, you know, didn't know 150 years ago, but now it's very clear, crystal clear as a matter of fact. Well, even, even the historicity of David was uh, challenged uh, for many, many centuries, but uh, with the discovery of the House of David stone uh, in Dan, um, my, that's, that's been muted quite a bit. There's still some holdouts that don't believe David ever existed, but it's getting harder and harder for them to do that. Well, well uh, what about uh, doctrine in the, in the uh, Bible? Uh, inerrancy as it relates to doctrine, is that uh, a factor there? Well, you know, if the Bible is inspired by God, that sources from God, and um, God is perfect, so he's giving us truth, that means we can trust not just the history or science angles of the Bible, but we can trust it in areas uh, that we might call metaphysics or areas that we can't get at uh, with our senses, like the nature of God. You know, how do you verify that God's holy? Well, we take God at his word uh, that he's holy. And, and, of course, one of the problems in our, another problem in our day is people are avoiding uh, the straightforward statements of the Bible concerning the nature of God. For example, they don't like the fact that God is a judge mm. or that there's a place called hell that exists that people actually go to because, and they reject that because that's harsh of God, yet the Bible's very clear about it. And even sweet Jesus talked a lot about that. Uh, mm. Jesus is the one who gives us more descriptions about yeah. hell than anybody else. Nobody talks as much about hell in the Bible as, as Jesus does. Now, Paul doesn't, he speaks of destruction and so forth, but perdition. But it is Jesus who really speaks about hell more than anybody else, the meek and mild Lamb of God. Uh, and boy, he lays it out on uh, uh, as clear as it can be. And uh, well, why do you think uh, the nature of God is being, uh, especially his, uh, his wrath and his his judgmental nature and his uh, the, the fact that he has a hell prepared. Why, why do people avoid that? Why are they uh, unhappy with that? Well, most people uh, don't like to be told they're wrong or that they're accountable. So I think it's an accountability issue. Uh, every culture is constantly trying to reshape God in their image, the image of people. And so uh, it came out of the 1990s, and now we're looking for a 1990s Bill Clinton kind of God, and uh, you know, feels your pain, but is not someone that would ever punish or inflict pain. And so uh, we, we continually remake him every every generation, maybe even every 10 years or so. There's a new angle that comes out that recrafts who God is and describes him, and uh, that's unfortunate because it's like people can't be satisfied with what the Bible actually says. They've got to keep inventing new things. Why is, it, why is it important that God is a God of judgment and wrath as well as a loving God? Well, the main reason is that's the truth. Mm -hmm. You know, if it's uh, you know if, if reality was something else, that would be, you know be different. We'd have to be in a different conversation. But the reality is, God's a God of justice and a God of love. Both those things have to be taken into account. Uh, there was a real fall into real sin, and it's a historical fact. And uh, we have to deal with that. If there is no God who can judge, 
then I'm not sure we could ever claim, honestly, that there would ever be a solution to all the evil that's in the world. And so we have to let God, the God of the Lord of the Earth, who always does right, take care of things. So God cannot tolerate evil, then how can he tolerate us? Yeah. Well, that's a good question, but it has an easy answer. Yes. And the easy answer is, uh, his great love and mercy produced Jesus who died on the cross to take away our sins, to provide a way out so that we wouldn't have to be accountable for our sins since Jesus already paid the price. Uh, that's a marvelous good news there. Um, well, uh, what about what about the churches now? How, how about uh, the way they're operating and uh, worshiping and uh, serving the Lord? What are, what are your thoughts on that? Well, uh, I think we are fighting about a lot of things that are unnecessary. Uh, but I think a lot of that stems from the shallowness there's not a depth in theology, a depth in the, in the Word of God, those kinds of things. Uh, but I think out of all of those things, the number one thing that bothers me more than anything else is that our churches don't really seem to care about other people and their souls. Uh, I mean, Jesus uh, wants every Christian to be a witness for his faith. Mm -hmm. uh, all of us should be willing to walk across the street and share with our neighbors uh, what Jesus means to us. Yeah, but most of our churches are into self-help and self-development and doing what pleases us instead of trying to reach the world for Christ. Self-help and self-development. And uh, what, what seems to be like a psychological Christianity or something along that line. Uh, something of a gloss. And there's very little of the scriptures in that whole thing to what they're really doing but you're you're wanting to get back to the basics and one of them is evangelism and sharing the gospel with the lost how how can they learn to do that or what are the ways that that can be a well the first thing is our uh, pastors and our churches need to recapture that as a, ma a major purpose of the church and then until they see the main purpose of the church as including evangelism i know there's the training of the sheep but uh, the ch sheep are to be trained to, to win people to jesus too and unless uh, the pastors get that vision, then uh, there's no hope in those churches. So I think we need to, uh, in our seminaries, uh, inculcate in all in the, the young men coming out to be pastors uh, the importance of evangelism. So if we can lose that battle, then the rest of it uh, is, is gone anyway. Uh, outside of that, I don't know what else we can do. Uh, just keep plugging away. I know in some of our adult classes, we. Uh Incorporate part of, of it, and just asking uh, the the people to share their testimony, and getting used to just sharing what Christ uh, means to them and how they came to know Him uh, seems to be a well. It's a very educational thing for our people, and uh, we get to know one another a lot better. But also, it gets the people used to sharing uh, how they came to know the Lord and uh, what the gospel means to them, and that. That's just been a great blessing to our people. Well, any, any of those uh, small ways we can do that are just uh, wonderful. And it does seem like Christians today are intimidated by our culture more than any other time. And I, you know, our response, we ought to stiffen our backs, yeah. stand up, and uh, be strong. Here we are, have all yeah. this freedom, but we don't no, utilize it. And people right. really don't have freedom. They're, they're out preaching the gospel, it seems like. So it should be a shame to us. Hmm. Well... Uh, we certainly appreciate your uh, talking with us, uh, Dr. Stallard, and sharing with us your vision of what uh, is being taught in your seminary and should be taught and what the churches should be doing. And uh, thank you so much for being with us. Thanks today. for having me.